if I can have your attention just a second, our first uh, candidate has got to be somewhere else shortly, and uh, we wanted to get him a chance to say a few words, and uh, his name is Whitney Westerfield, and he's going to uh, be running for the Attorney General, and uh, he's running against um, Brashear, A. Brashear. That tells you something. Okay, so let's give uh, Whitney a big hand and let him get started. Everybody hear me okay? Good morning, I'm Whitney Westerfield. I've had a chance to meet just about everybody here this morning uh, as you all were coming in. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate the opportunity for the forum. I thank you all for coming out uh, on a Saturday morning. And uh, I'm just I'm thankful that you're involved and engaged in the process. That means a lot to me as a candidate. It means a lot to me as a fellow Kentuckian. Uh, I think the, the issues that we face every day in Kentucky are pretty important. And I think it's important that we all get involved in the process. I'm Whitney Westerfield. I'm running to be your next attorney general. I'm from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. My wife, Amanda, who is an elementary Spanish teacher at a Christian school in Hopkinsville, could not be here with me today. She's taking care of our 14-month-old little girl, Hadley, who is walking and talking. The talking is still mostly gibberish, but it's adorable to listen to nonetheless. And uh, they wish they could be here today, but I've got a, a full schedule, and it's hard to bring a 14-month-old everywhere you go. Uh, they're back home in Hopkinsville. That's where I'm from. Before I was in the Senate, where I serve right now as the senator for the 3rd Senate District, that's Christian Todd in Logan Counties, down in West Kentucky, about an hour and a half further west of Bowling Green. If you hit the lake, you've gone one county too far. I serve in the Senate now, but before that, I was an assistant Commonwealth's attorney, a felony prosecutor in Christian County for a little over five years. I've tried cases from homicides to misdemeanors and everything in between. In that job for those five years, I worked as a prosecutor. I worked with law enforcement. I worked with crime victims, sometimes the surviving family members of crime victims, through the jury trial process, holding their hands, hugging them, drying their tears, wins and losses. I've got that experience working with them. I know what that's like. I know what it's like for law enforcement, the, the, the troubles that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis to find justice in my community. And I fought for that public safety in my community. I'm proud of that experience, and I was there for over five years, and I resigned that office to run for the Senate and defeated a 20-year Democratic incumbent who had been in office who had, who had been in office for too long and who had long since quit putting in the effort, I thought, and his values didn't reflect mine or what I thought the values of the 3rd Senate District were. And I thought somebody new needed to be there. God blessed me with a victory. I carried each of my three counties, and I've been serving in the Senate ever since. Since the first day on the job in the Senate, I have been chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And over the last three years, as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I've been able to work on public safety policy that affects all of Kentucky, all of our families. Last year, I overhauled our juvenile code system. Biggest reforms in 30 years. It's now a national model. West Virginia has borrowed whole chapters of our bill. Kansas is looking at it right now. South Dakota has looked at it. This year, I passed the dating violence bill and heroin legislation. The dating violence bill I passed in such ways to create protections we need without diminishing the value and the definition and the, the thought and the concept of family, the traditional family as we want it to be. There was a way to accomplish both, and we did that. It's a big deal for particularly places like Louisville, Lexington, where college towns exist. There are a lot of young women my daughter's going to be one of them one day who didn't until this bill have the protections this bill creates. Kentucky was the last state in the country to create it. I was the first senator to give it a hearing three years ago, two years ago, two, three sessions ago. And I've been pushing ever since. Finally got it through this year. Then the heroin bill. For those of you that in this area, you know how big an issue heroin is. In northern Kentucky and Lexington, it's a big deal. It's starting to trickle out in the rest of the state. But you've got dozens and dozens of people. Places in northern Kentucky are suffering from dozens, multiple dozens of overdose deaths a month. And we've been trying for three years to get something through. And I was there. I was in the room. And people who are as far left from each other as they are far right worked on a bill. And we got something done. 
It increases access to care and substance abuse treatment for people suffering from addiction. It increases penalties on the people who are trafficking it. It increases the resources for first responders and law enforcement. I helped write that bill. That compromise bill, but it's doing good for the people of Kentucky. I highlight my experience because I believe it's important in this race. It's important because the next Attorney General of the Commonwealth, the top law officer of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, needs to know what it's like to work with public safety issues. To know what they mean, to know what they do, to know how it works for the people on the front lines and prosecuting offices and law enforcement offices around the state. I've done it. My opponent most simply has not. My opponent, his experience for the office and qualifications for the office of Attorney General begin and end with being the son of the city governor. I want more qualifications for my next Attorney General than that. Amen. Particularly this governor. Yeah. Because the next AG is going to have to stand up to this president. The next AG is going to have to stand up to the job killing, family killing creations, regulations and, and policies that this president is trying to promote. And what he can't get passed through the Congress, he's going to do by executive order. I've said this a couple of times. I think my first year on the job as AG is going to be the most important because it'll be Obama's last year in office. And he's going to try to force things upon us that he can't get through the Congress. And we need an AG that's not going to think twice about standing up to that. This president scares me to death. Foreign policy-wise, healthcare-wise, education-wise, religious liberty-wise, pick a policy issue. We need somebody that's going to challenge it from the first day. Amen. Not have somebody that's going to have to worry about questioning his dad's legacy as governor or his party standard bearer as the former AG, Jack Conway. We need somebody that's prepared to go to work. And frankly, who's not trying to do this job to prepare themselves for a run for something else. Someone made the joke to me two or three weeks ago that AG stands for aspiring governor. <laughs> he can't. We need an AG that's going to be an attorney general for the people of Kentucky. Right. That's what I want to be for you. I have three priorities for the office. The first is the increase and intensify the, lit the litigation of the office against the federal or even the state government when it runs afoul of us, our rights, our businesses, our economy. If it disproportionately hurts us, it hurts our families, it's going to get uh, <laughs> to some serious scrutiny for me. Litigation if necessary. And as I just said, there are a slew of examples where Jack Conway's either been late to show up for these fights, right? Showing up at all. Immigration. 26 states challenged the president's executive amnesty action. Regardless of your thoughts about immigration or mine, regardless of our policy positions, and we may or may not see eye to eye, that's in immaterial. The president has specific authority and he has exceeded it to try to do what he's doing. He is not permitted to do it until the Congress changes the law. And what is done is wrong. It's got to be stopped. 26 states challenged the president. They've been found to be right in federal court. We weren't one of the 26. General Conway's been too busy running for something else. Too busy suing Marathon, perhaps for valid issues of price gouging, but it's very suspect that it comes seven and a half years into an eight-year term. We need an AG that's not going to be looking for PR value and things that are always in service of the next campaign, but instead is going to be there to do the job that needs to be done. That's the first issue. Second issue, the cyber crimes unit in the office. Let me give you some context. The state police in Kentucky testified this year. The state police is not under the AG's office, but just so you understand the, the scope of things and how bad the situation is. State police has something called the ICAC Task Force, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. They're able right now to investigate only 2% of the internet filth involving kids in Kentucky. They live hand to mouth with grant dollars. It's, it ebbs and flows up and down. They, don't, they can't depend on it, rely on it. And the AG's unit is roughly comparable in size. It's only got four people. The AG cyber crimes unit is about one fourth the size of the room we're in. A bunch of computers. They can't possibly do everything they need to do to educate people of all ages, young, middle, and old about the risks involved of using the internet and cyber crimes and identity theft and scams and email and all those issues, not to mention investigating. So that's going to be a focus of my office. And then the final thing is just to be active with policy, to work with the legislature. In three years, three sessions I've been in the Senate. If I want to care to venture a guess how many times Jack Conway has darkened my doorstep? Right there. 
never, never come to see me. I, even if I wasn't chairman, I'm a member of the General Assembly. There are only 138 of us. Make time. But as chairman of the judiciary, the committee where his universe exists, working on the heroin bill, on dating violence, on juvenile justice reform, on the Brian Durbin Act in Lexington about law enforcement and homicide, any number of issues related to public safety. He's never darkened my doorstep not to advocate for or against anything. No bill, no budget line item, nothing. That's got to change. On the heroin bill this year, as I said, people who are as far left as far right from one another were in the room. Y'all here in Louisville, you know Joni Jenkins. I can't possibly be further removed from Joni Jenkins philosophically. She is as far left as I am far right. We're just not the same person. When we were in the room, we found compromise on parts of this language about the heroin bill. It can be done. And I didn't have to compromise about my values to do it. Jack Conway showed up for the bill signing, spoke for five or six minutes, and that one of these candidates for AG is equipped and prepared. The other one is trying to smear and attack the one who's equipped and prepared, because that's all that he's got to do. And remember that his father has helped him raise a record-breaking amount of money, $2.7 million dollars the most for any down-ballot candidate in the history of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. But we're close to winning. You get on Facebook, or Twitter, next door neighbor, visit your neighbor, go to church, whatever, at work, wherever. Tell people about the candidates that stand where you stand. Tell them about the candidates that don't. Remind people to get out there and vote. Offer rides to the people who need a ride. Share this message with as many people as you can to get the vote out. It's be a low turnout election. The people... People have asked, why should Christians get involved in government? It's corrupt, it's dirty, and so forth. I'd say this. There are 138 members of the legislature, and there are seven constitutional officers. Whether or not you show up on election day or before then, between now and then, is it going to change the fact that there are 138 members of the legislature and seven constitutional officers? We can get involved and make sure that the people that hold the values that we cherish the most fill those seats, or we stay home. And I guarantee you the people that don't, We'll fill those seats. So get involved. Thank you all for being out here today. I appreciate the time. Thank you. How do you know? Last poll that was out uh, that I know about uh, shows me tied. And he had actually dropped two points and I had climbed five. Uh, wow. I've, I've seen, I've heard secondhand other polls that show different, different uh, deviations between our numbers, but it, there was a, a post on Twitter earlier this week from some uh, the governing magazine that's still called it a toss-up. It is a close race. And just yesterday, a fresh, new, completely preposterous attack ad came up from my opponent. I'm running ads, by the way, when you see mine, you see them on Facebook or on television. I'm not attacking him. I do call him out for the negative ads, but then I talk about my experience and my qualifications for the job and that that matters. I'm not spending my time or my money or the money of my donors slinging mud, and he is, they wouldn't do that if they weren't afraid to lose. By the way, I didn't mention this, I've been endorsed by Kentucky Right to Life, the Fraternal Order of Police, the state FOP, and the NRA, all three. Two of those came after the, the questionnaire was submitted. That's why they're not showing up on the question. I'm curious what you're going to do about the Tim Davis situation. Well, the AG... Uh, AG is limited to what the AG can do uh, in terms of the, the Kim Davis situation, that specific situation. I wouldn't prosecute them. The Constitution, the laws of the Commonwealth still protects a religious freedom. Amen. The Religious Freedom Restoration Amen. Act passed two years ago over my opponent's father's veto. Yeah. He continues to be hostile to people of all faith. Our faith, their faith, everybody else's faith. That bill was passed two years ago over the governor's veto, and it's still the law. And as I've talked about this, people may not like that that's the law. I do. But they may not like it. They may hate that that religious freedom is protected. And I've met a lot that don't like that. And I can't believe that. But I have. It's still the law. And the law requires that if the state's going to interfere with your religious beliefs, if it's going to infringe on your beliefs, which it can do, but if it's going to try, it has to meet a two-part test. The first is that the state has to have a compelling interest to do that. In this case, the Supreme Court's rule. I don't like the rule. I think it's opened up a Pandora's box of future 
marriages that people are going to try to argue can exist scares me to death. But I recognize the Supreme Court's authority, and the Supreme Court has ruled we've got to do that. We've got to issue these licenses. But the state also has to meet that compelling interest in the least restrictive way. It has to infringe on your right in the least restrictive way, which means in this case, if there's a way to issue these marriage licenses and protect Kim Davis's beliefs, the state must do it. Not may, not should, sort of kind. Must, shall do it. The state must protect both sets of rights. That's why I've said put this form online. Change the form. The form is created by the executive branch agency. And last I checked, they answered the governor. And I'll remind you, in June, when the Supreme Court order ruling first came out, he issued an order that day, within minutes of the Supreme Court's ruling. Clerks comply with this order. And they changed the forms then. A few months later, when all Kim Davis wants is to have her name taken off of the thing. He won't lift the finger. And, and that, that's even before we mentioned that that's a completely different standard than the one applied to Jack Conway a year earlier. Right. He didn't do his oath because he had to be true to himself. When Kim Davis and others are true to themselves, they're told to do your job or quit. He wouldn't order the form changed. Have you ever seen, have you seen a picture of the form of they, as they have changed it in Round County? They took the form, they ran it through a typewriter, it typed capital X's over her name. And the court, in the last week and a half, ordered the governor to say whether or not they would recognize these changes as valid. And the governor said yes. So the governor, who claims he has no authority to change the form himself, said that the deputy clerks running it through a typewriter could. I can't make it up. As AG, I will absolutely fight for both rights. I disagree vehemently with one, and I agree incredibly viciously in the other one. But as AG, I can't pick and choose which laws I support. As an individual, with you, I would advocate the legislature to change any policy I disagree with. But you should expect nothing less of the Attorney General to enforce the law and to do the oath and not pick and choose when to do it. Whitney, I would like to address one more thing. With, I'd like to ask him to ask an answer question. And it's really you know, um, concerning a lot of people down in, I just found this out last weekend, down in Tennessee, right across from Franklin County, <clears throat> Tennessee, I, I don't know what county, Mara County or something, they required the this, this students in high school, in the history class, and they have to bow down and learn how to bow down to awe, they have rough and everything. It's Are you serious? It's, yes, it's just, it just started this fall. And what would you do, what could we do as an attorney general? Because I, I don't want that to come in Kentucky, and I'm going to find out, I know some people that live down there, and we're, we need to do I don't something. know how that doesn't violate uh, the First Amendment. I don't, I don't know how telling a kid to do that. I, 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 mean, I don't know it, how it's part of a history curriculum, and they have to do it. But anyway, I just wanted to do that. I never did like the volunteers the much Muslim, anyway. A lot of the Muslims have already taken over the curriculum books, too, they said. If you, I, you know, I've read and, and listened to Dr. David Jeremiah, and, and there are other books out there that talk about and give examples of things where they are given accommodations. <laughs> where a separate meal is prepared because their religious faith, or a time for prayer is, is prepared or allowed for because their religious faith, that Christians suddenly get nothing. And, and our, our request for an accommodation in the case of Kim Davis, changing the form, it's all she asked for. Wouldn't think of it. Not going to lift a finger. I'll remind you the night she was remanded, and I'm not arguing with the judge. The judge had the authority in that case to lock her up. I disagree with it. But the case law in Kentucky and everywhere else clearly establishes a court's contempt power. He also, though, could have fined her. Could have extended the stay so she didn't have to comply with the order until the legislature reconvened. He had other options. So I'm not, I'm not disputing that he had the authority to do it. But I want to remind you, the night she was remanded into custody, Andy Bashir and his dad were having a fundraiser in Franklin. And I, I actually, that same night, at the same time, I was advocating in front of the EPA against a new rule they've got coming out called the Stream Protection Rule. I was doing the work that the AG ought to be doing all the time, and they're raising money. Because two million and a half bucks isn't enough, apparently. They're trying to buy the race. And I don't think he's going to, on religious liberty issues, he's been silent. He says, oh, it's, it's being fought in the court. That's the proper forum for that. Well, as the next AG, that's your forum. Why don't you speak to him? He's not going to do it. I may win or I may lose, 
And I pray God blesses me with a win, but I'm going to talk about these things regardless. Thank you all. Keep us in your prayers, please. Uh, Whitney Westerfield, and he's running for the Attorney General. All of these volunteers did a tremendous job, and we couldn't do anything without them. Now, you know, um, Whitney was saying, uh, how can they teach uh, force children to uh, follow Muslim beliefs? He said, that's against the First Amendment. Well, let's put it this way. It doesn't matter what the law says. If you got the wrong person in office, they're going to do the wrong thing. Okay? So that's why we this meeting is so important. Now, let me say one other thing. How many people have gotten these, the uh, voter guide? These are not just for you to get one and take it with you to the poll. That's important. But there's more to it than that. You ought to take 10, 20, 50, or 100 of them and uh, give them out to everybody in your church, everybody in your neighborhood, and uh, just uh, everybody at work. And to put them in the paper boxes. Okay, so our next speaker is Mike Harmon running for uh, Auditor of Public Accounts. Let's How's everybody doing today? All right, well, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you here today. Before I get uh, too deep, I, sometimes I chase rabbits, so let me just go ahead and say I'm endorsed. Uh, by the Kentucky Right to Life. I'm endorsed by the Northern Kentucky Right to Life. They wanted me to get over just a little bit. Endorsed by the Northern Kentucky Right to Life. And uh, my opponent would not even fill out his questionnaire. He is obviously pro-choice. Uh, it's it's interesting that he tells us to uh, refer to the Bible when uh, apparently he's not paying too close attention. Now, I always like to start with something funny because we deal with so many serious things. So I want to tell you this story about this young lady. Uh, she was from Kentucky, and she fell in love with this Indiana boy. His name was Clarence. So she calls up her daddy and says, Daddy, I have fallen in love with Clarence. And Dad says, isn't Clarence from Indiana? He said, yeah. She said, yeah, he is. She said, well, I don't like those Indiana boys. They're mean. Sometimes they throw chairs. If you're from Indiana, forgive me, but... They throw chairs, but you know how little girls are? They've got their daddy wrapped around their finger. And so she goes ahead and she gets married. About two years later, she calls up and says, Daddy, you were right. Clarence is being mean to me. And said, don't you worry. We'll grab you two brothers. We'll come up there and we'll take care of old Clarence. So they hop in the car. They drive up here to Louisville. They drive across the bridge into Indiana. As soon as they get over the bridge, the dad turns around and starts heading right back to Louisville. And the two brothers says, wait, wait, Daddy, aren't we going to help Sissy? He said, boys, I'd love to. But didn't you see that sign we crossed the bridge? Clarence, 11 foot 7. <laughs> All right. Sorry, sorry. So, sometimes sometimes in these races, we feel like we're facing a, a Clarence. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. My, my opponent raised about a million dollars, plus he has some super PAC uh, money helping him out as well. I raised somewhere around thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars, but my opponent has decided to do these attack ads. I don't know. Has anybody seen the attack ads on me? Yeah. Well, uh, when this is all over, of course, I've got to run on to Frenchburg. When this is all over, if you all could help me find my airplane, I would really appreciate it. I don't know where it is. They say I have one, but uh, no. The the whole thing, the attack ads are somewhat ridiculous. They've got me jumping up and shoving a baggage handler. And I'll tell you right now, nowadays, if you shove a baggage handler, you'll get an interesting body uh, screening from the TSA. And they also have them, it's kind of sad, they they show them like this private jet and they're serving me a drink. And now, I'm not judgmental against people that want to have a drink, but I'm a teetotaler myself. So, uh, I, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where it's just the liberals at their best uh, attacking us with stuff that doesn't exist with money that someone else has given them. Now, uh, to give you a little background about myself, uh, I am a state representative. I've been a state representative I'm in the middle of my seventh term. Uh, actually, I ran twice and lost twice. And when I first was elected, I was the first Republican from Boyle County to be elected to that office in 102 years. And uh, thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, as far as I know, only the third altogether, but it had been 102 years. Now, since that time, I've been reelected six more times for a total of seven. And it was up until redistricting, which was just a, about two years ago, uh, it was a heavily, heavily registered Democrat area. Matter of fact, Boyle County is so bad. I tell people Boyle County is so bad that the only countywide elected official that's a Republican countywide down is just the coroner, and that's just to declare the Republican Party dead on arrival in Boyle County. So God has been good to me, good to my family. Uh, I've married to the same wonderful lady for 25 years. We have two beautiful daughters. Got a brand new grandbaby, four months old. So as much as I enjoy talking to you all and heading to Frenchburg and heading to Cynthia, I'm going to be even more tickled when I get a chance to get home and see that grandbaby again. I just saw him real quick and then headed out. So so these these are good times. We've been blessed. But I think the reason that I've been reelected to state rep time and time again, even in a heavily Democrat area, is because I treat everybody the same. You know. I stand on my core values. I'm a strong, conservative, Christian individual, and I stand on those values. And when people call me, uh, I don't look, you know, I don't check see if you're a Democrat or see if you're Republican or see if you're independent. I just serve. Uh, but in doing that, I've still stood on my strong, conservative values. Uh, there's a handful of us that a lot of times are, we kind of call ourselves the no caucus because we, uh, we vote no on a lot of issues if we feel like they're bad. We've, we've actually, when you're in the minority, you spend more time uh, fighting bad legislation than you do advancing good legislation. So it, it's one of those things. But we've been real tickled. I was actually part of the group that uh, got the 2004 marriage amendment uh, passed. And uh, for those of you, I don't know how many of you remember, but in 2004, it was great because we had people circling the Capitol. We had people praying. We had people with their Bibles. And I'll be honest with you, that's the only way that bill got passed. Because the Democrats were trying to pull a fast one on the citizens of Kentucky. Because if you remember, they tried to put two issues in a constitutional amendment. And you can only have one issue in a constitutional amendment. So they wanted to look like they were voting in favor of that. So they could go home to their constituents and say, hey, we're voting in favor of that. But they knew that if they could keep two issues in it, it would get thrown out in the courts. We had people praying, had many of us, myself, almost all the Republicans and one or two Democrats, uh, walked out in protest. And then the next day, they had to call it back up. They let us call it up, remove the one, the extra issue off of it. And we had a good, solid bill, made it to the ballot, and 75% of the citizens of Kentucky voted in favor of that. 